thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is our final event in the series of the Utah Women's Leadership Speaker and Dialogue for this academic year, and we're so glad you came to join us tonight. We'll have people continue to trickle in. We know that parking's difficult and there's a lot going on campus tonight, but we are so glad that you chose, chose to be here with us. So my name is Robin Scribner. I'm the Assistant Director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Our mission here is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women through informing, engaging, and developing their voices, confidence, influence, and leadership. We do this primarily through research. That's one of our main offerings here to the state. But we have a lot of events like this one tonight and uh, other speaking engagements that we do. We create resources and we're heavily involved in community outreach. So a lot of you already know this. You've been to other events and other things that we're doing and we're so glad you're here tonight. I would like to give a quick shout out to our wonderful volunteers who've helped us tonight. We also have ambassadors. If you're one of the ambassadors for the project, could you go ahead and stand up? I know we've got Rich here, Carolyn. Our ambassadors help us in a lot of wonderful ways. And then I'd like to introduce our staff. Deirdre's up in the back. She is our coordinator. Shirosky was running the volunteers. And then Heather is here. Heather's over here. And she uh, does some writing and some media relations for us here. Most of all, I'd like to thank our wonderful premier sponsors. We could not hold these events without them. We feel so strongly about keeping these events free for everyone to attend. And so Squire and doTERRA provide a wonderful opportunity for us to keep this going. We also have other sponsors, several here at UVU, uh, the Center for Advancement of Leadership, the Woodbury School of Business, the Women's Success Center, and the Business Resource Center. And also the Utah Education Network helps us out with the cameras and the filming. And I hope you all know that these events are edited and then available to watch later on. So if you've got friends that didn't make it, they can come watch them later. And we have social media. So if you don't already follow us on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, please find us, tweet about our events, share this information on our social media sites. You'll also find um, our research, things that we share, but events and other resources from other great organizations within the state that are also serving women and girls. So some great resources there. So uh, many of you probably also already know Dr. Susan Madsen, but I'm just going to give you a quick little introduction to her. She's going to start us off this evening, and then she'll be followed by our panelists. But Dr. Susan Madsen is the Orrin R. Woodbury Professor of Leadership and Ethics here at UVU. She's the founder and director of two statewide initiatives, the Utah Women in Education Initiative and the Utah Women in Leadership Project. She is a globally recognized scholar, speaker, writer, and thought leader on women's issues and leadership. She's written several books and hundreds of articles on this topic. And just from a personal perspective, I can guarantee that she spends more hours every day than most of us are awake, focused, passionately working on serving and um, empowering women and girls within the state. So I'll turn the time over to Dr. Madsen. It's great to be with you here, and I uh, just got back from the Middle East a couple days ago, so I'm out of the haze, but uh, I was just telling the folks here on the front row that I'm not multitasking well, but uh, enjoyed working with women over there in the Middle East. So I'm excited for this event. I've been looking forward to this event, and we'll have more people trickle in because we, ha we had about 1,000 people signed up for tonight. But it is a busy week on campus because President um, Tumenes has her inauguration tomorrow. And so um, it is a busy week all week. Now, look at this picture over here. I'm going to get teary-eyed. I, I just put that up. It was taken on Saturday, and that is my daughter, Stacy and her new daughter, Hadley. And um, isn't that a beautiful picture? You've got to say it's a beautiful picture. <laughs> OK, what are you going to say when I ask you that? Um, so I love this, and I love this talk, this uh, topic of raising girls to become leaders, competence, confidence, and courage. And when we look at the word raising, we really, we, we didn't necessarily say daughters. We said girls. And that is because, have you heard the saying, it takes a village? And so who helps besides parents raise girls? Grandparents, educators, church leaders, Girl Scout leaders? I mean, anybody. 
helps, I mean, anybody can help raise girls. So that's what we wanted to, to do tonight. I'm gonna just have about a half hour, we're going to, I'm going to give you some research from research that I've done and some other research as well. Other scholars have done research. And then we're gonna have this great panel that'll dig in deeper to some of these issues. So I'm gonna dive right in. So with my research, actually, I, I, I'm kind of in an awkward space because the things are <laughs> over there and over there. So I'm going to have to turn my head to see which slide we're on. Um, but I have done research for years on tr looking at the lifetime journeys of high-profile women leaders and how they d develop leadership throughout their lives from the time they were babies in their homes, elementary school, uh, high school, college, their careers and so forth. My passion through the years has really been this second one, to better understand how we can help raise girls to be leaders. Teenagers, you know, really develop that confidence and competence to be leaders. And I looked at parenting and home and at activities and influential people and a lot of different kinds of things. And also, um, in this presentation, we're gonna answer many questions. One question I wanted to throw up here very quickly is, do you think your siblings can influence your leadership development as you think back at your home life? So I thought I would show you a picture of my siblings. Some of you have seen this before if you've heard me speak. <laughs> so do you think, uh, do you think I have a lot of what I do? I'm kind of not flowery too much, although I went with a feminine top tonight. <laughs> um, but the way I do things, the way I lead is actually kind of between a man and a woman. I'm, I'm right in the middle there. And it really is because I competed with my brothers. I compete more than a lot of women. I liked sports and did those things because of how I was raised. And each of you, are in homes, some of you are young women developing leadership right now, many of you are raising uh, daughters in your own homes, but these are things to think about. So what I wanna talk in this time I have with you today is share first of all, a few things from my own research and books um, to give you some ideas for your own life, for you young women, uh, but how to influence for the rest of us. Uh, then I will have three critical components of women's leadership development and how they relate to raising girls, um, some confidence studies, and then a few final thoughts. So that's the plan. Are you feeling good about tonight? Are you with me, everybody? Okay. <laughs> All right. So part one is really the home environment. Now again, what I did was, for my first two or three studies, I interviewed first 10 university presidents, women university presidents across the country, very high level women leaders. My second book is about uh, interviews with 10 women governors in the United States. And I really dug down into what they did, you know, how they developed their voice and their confidence through the years and the people that made an impact and those kinds of things. And then my books end with, and then I've, I've done a study in China and the Middle East and Eastern Europe and a few other places on the similar thing. And there's some real interesting similarities across the world uh, in these things. So a few things to think about when we think about raising girls to be leaders. What I found was that these homes of these women leaders were very learning focused. And in fact, every woman that I have interviewed through the years said that she was an avid reader, liked to read. It was really shocking. I mean, every single one, it's like I like to read, learn, grow. That was a theme in the home. Open to learning and growth and development, open to change and found joy in change. But sometimes people are like, when you say you need to change or develop or whatever, you're like, I don't wanna change, you know? But the, the change was very, a, a positive thing in the homes. The dinner table conversation, oh my gosh, was this fascinating. I, I didn't even ask this question and every single person I've interviewed through the years talked about the dinner table conversation. And I have to admit, I do not like to cook. I just don't. But after I did this research, I'm like, come to my four children. Come, come to the table. <laughs> let's, talk. let's talk. Because I was so interested. And they were, in, they were um, 
not, not situations where the parents hushed them. They actually would, something would happen in the town, like a new stop sign or a new light, let's say, a new light was coming up, and they would have a discussion with their children and bring both view, all the views up and not argue or not hush their children. And actually, uh, part of my, my undergrad is argumentation, it's speech and debate. Does this sound familiar? And so we argue different points and we become okay with that. Interestingly, when I moved back to Utah and started teaching about, um, oh, it's been 16, 17, 18 years ago, I, I remember teaching an MBA class early on and some of my students said, there's too much arguing in, in here. They just wanted me to go, like, give the stuff and have them accept it instead of kind of going back and forth. You don't have to get all emotional and go back and forth, but that argumentation, the homes had that. And the dinner table was where the women said they found their voices. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I, like I said, many of us don't, not many of us, I don't like to cook. Maybe the rest of you do. But there's still, you can do a lot of things at the dinner table. I assemble is what I call it. I assemble things. <laughs> so um, they discussed finances and other difficult topics openly. And we are, in fact, I'm, if you're on my listserv, you'll get this note, but, but I'm on a committee for a finance conference, Women in the Money Conference on the 22nd of, of April, really talking about talking to your kids about money and different things like that. Those difficult topics were important. Service-oriented parents, and for the mothers, for the fathers too, but example and the self-esteem of the mothers. Oh my gosh, was that strong in the research I've done. Just their example and what they, what they did, that confidence, their posture. I mean, those kinds of things really moved to the daughters. Uh, when we studied uh, a number of years ago, I studied, my master's was in exercise physiology and wellness. And interestingly, the research, and I, I don't want to make anybody feel bad out there, but I, until I realized this, I used to say to my daughter, if you, sometimes I'd be in front of her and I would just say, you know, I gotta lose five pounds. I gotta, you know, we say those things. But the research says if the mother is talking about that, the daughter, even at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, will think, I've got to lose five pounds even if there's no reason that she should lose five pounds. So it's so fascinating. So when we raise girls to be more confident, we as mothers, especially fathers too, but we as mothers need to do the same thing. We need to, to work on our confidence as well. So, um, and this one isn't home environment, but I thought this was fun. So there was one position that young women had that they thought helped them develop leadership the best. The governors especially, thinking back to high school. What do you think? It, it's a waitress. <laughs> Interesting. So they multitasked and, and learned so many things. That was the one that actually helped them. And plus the governors, it was the first time they had to like be really nice to get like donations, you know. <laughs> so, so that's kind of fun too. All right, um, a few stories here. My earliest memories, so these, these are from the governors. My earliest memories included going with my mother to count paper ballots until two o'clock in the morning. I got a lot of my interest in politics and current events from my father. We talked about it at the dinner table. We were able to voice our opinions at the dinner table where everyone's voice was important. He'd watch the news every night with only one TV in the house. This was a while ago. <laughs> um, everyone was around to hear the news. He would quiz us sort of in a sort of a game format on the state capitals and political figures. When we traveled, we would stop at historical markers. So these are things that they felt were really important. This next theme is reflection. This was one of the strongest, strongest themes in all the research I have found, that in raising girls to be leaders, we need to teach them how to reflect. We need to teach them um, how to upset and observe and think through things. Like when hard things happen, don't just ignore them because the learning comes from reflecting, not from the experience itself. There's some research about this, not from the experience itself. It's the reflection on the experience that gives you the learning. 
And so when hard things happen, you know, instead of patting, so sorry, sorry, teach them, like, what did you learn? You know, some of those things, it's the reflection that's important. And this transformational learning has you mentally construct the experience, then you reflect, and then you have action. And then I also found that transformational moments were critical. These women leaders could remember the smallest thing that changed their lives because they had reflected and so they were able to keep those um, in their minds. And I'm gonna share one, this was clear from the 60s uh, when this happened. I'm gonna share one example, and each of us have that, have different examples of transformational moments. But we, as parents and as other influencers, need to pull out some of these transformational moments and help create that for our daughters and girls in other areas. One specific incident really shaped me with regard to racial challenges. Even though we were of modest means, like most families in the South, we had a black maid. This was in the 60s. Her name was Ophelia. She was in our home most days from the time I was crawling until I was seven. In many ways, she raised me. I still remember so many things about household chores and cooking that she taught me. I loved her dearly. Usually, Ophelia took the streetcar home, but for some reason one day, my father decided to take her home, and he asked me if I would like to go. I was terribly excited and jumped into the back seat of the car, and my father said, no, you have to sit in the front seat. Ophelia will sit in the back seat. That did not make sense to me as a child because the adult sat in the front. I sat in the front and was pretty upset about it. I cried easily, and I think I cried all the way. I was in the front seat, Ophelia was in the back, and it was just not right. When she got out of the car, my father turned to me and said something unforgettable. If she had ridden in the front seat with me, she would be dead by morning. It hit me to the very core in a way of understanding the injustice of the world that I lived in, where race was such an important issue. That had a huge impact on me, and it's a story I will never forget. So she was seven at this time. She was a white woman, and her whole career, she was the front line. She was a university president. White woman who took on racial issues because this impacted her, and she reflected on that. So when we have experiences, a real key is to help our daughters our young women in church groups, whatever it is, learn how to reflect and come up with, with the process in their own minds. So teachers, um, this is another thing to reflect, but amazingly, um, the teachers were really important in their lives. Now, if you know the self-esteem research, typically around 10 to 13, and some research is saying a little bit even earlier, <clears throat> boys and girls have about the same level of confidence until about that age. And then girls go down, puberty kind of starts hitting, and, and boys go up. And then girls are always kind of struggling with that. But interestingly, during this time, there was a fifth or sixth grade teacher for every single woman I've interviewed, no matter what country in the world, that made a big impact. My sixth grade teacher was a woman who was passionate about education. She conveyed her own personal joy and passion in the way she taught us. In some ways, I think these times make up moments for me in what we now call the life of the mind. This includes being able to gain shared joy out of thinking, reading, and learning. I saw that in her and I felt it in myself. The sheer joy that she felt was the joy that she ignited in me. And I don't think I ever had the chance to tell her that. I was much older before I realized it. It makes me want to be sure that teachers know of their potential impact. It's amazing how many teachers were impact. And it wasn't the easy teachers. It wasn't. It was the teachers that looked at you, knew you could do something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking on you. And, um, and then pushed you. And, and it, it's very interesting to look at the kinds of teachers. And then reflecting on that helps as well. Now, what subject of teacher in high school do you think was the most impactful for all these women? There was one that stuck out, huge. English, and math was actually second. My high school English teacher was an amazingly challenging teacher who really pulled out things that I think most of us never thought. We had lots of writing assignments, lots of challenges around things like vocabulary development. She wrote the most provocative thing in my yearbook, no lesser lights for you. It has stayed with me forever. She was really challenging me to be all I could be. She was very important in my life. 
Of course, parents are the most impactful, but I am amazed at the research how important other people are, including church leaders, especially here in Utah, and the research that we've done in Utah, and teachers can be, and counselors can be, but neighbors can be too, neighbors. In fact, when I realized this, I, um, my kids would come home, and I remember my youngest com- kid coming home one day, and he's, he, my office is right by the garage door, and the garage door opens, and I heard him say to his friend, go really quiet and fast past my mom's office because she'll ask you about college. <laughs> so I'm like, where are you? <laughs> Where are you going to go to college? What's going on? <laughs> so I, I didn't realize, you know, we kind of think about getting our own kids to, to college and everything. But, but and, and many of you young women, the powerfulness of peer, peer encouragement is so important to get women to college. We've done research on that and all kinds of other things too. I love, I think this is the last story, but I love this story. And what we found in my, in what I found actually in my research was that the parents were the most influential, but every woman had at least two other people during their like high school, junior high days that they said made a big impact on them. So parents and then at least two others. Now this is one example. One year when I was in high school, there was a big issue about four or five boys who had gotten expelled from school for a week or two. They had skipped school one day for the opening of fishing season and went fishing. I spoke to a teacher and said, this doesn't make any sense. She asked me if I would talk to the principal about it, so she walked me down to his office. I said, Mr. Smith, this doesn't make any sense. These boys are in trouble for skipping a day of school, and now you have them out of school for 10 days. Now they're fishing for 10 days straight. There's nothing sensible about that. Why don't you stop the suspension and bring them in and make them do long study halls to make up for what they missed? You've given them exactly what they wanted, more time to fish. (laughs) He said, it's really the only form of punishment we have for skipping school. I said, but there are other forms. It doesn't have to be this way. He listened to me. These adults seem to value my opinion. I ended up working in the principal's office during my junior and senior years of high school. Isn't that an interesting story? But, the, but you know, we're raising our own daughters and so forth, but the, the impact of this, especially during those high school, that you have something to offer, that you have a voice and people see that, that helps you get confidence and that helps your daughters get confidence so that, and this is a leadership, a form of leadership. Um, and, and I have a real broad definition of leadership. And then from my research, embracing difficulties and challenges. Some of the terms, challenges, struggles, trials, we use that word a lot in our culture, trials. Like, woe is me. Challenges, I like the word challenges, it's more active. Um, be a role model in, on how to respond to challenges. That, uh, actually, the, my women that I interviewed said they learned more about leadership from the difficulties and challenges than anything, any other successes. Think about that. So sometimes as parents and as influencers, we try and protect our daughters from failure or challenges. Actually, that's what gets that grit. That's what, so, and then we teach them to reflect. So you go through something that sucks, right? That's, sorry, crap and sucks are my two swear words. (laughs) Um, We do that, but then we learn how to process and then come out and learn. My daughter was funny. One time I I was picking her up when I used to have a minivan from something, and she had something real tough happen, and and I just went, "Mm mm-hmm. And then by the time I knew I had done what was right, by the time, like 10 minutes or 15 minutes later, she had talked her way all the way through and then came out and said, okay, I'm good. I'm like, okay, that's good. <laughs> She's got all the learning right out of that. Um, and then learning from everything, learning to learn uh, specifically leadership from everything. Um, I don't have time to kind of go into lots of details here, but I will tell you that there are strategies, and maybe this is another, another lesson on feedback. And I'll tell you, there's, there's ways to give feedback. The general, you're great, you're beautiful, all of that stuff doesn't really help develop confidence. A little bit of self-esteem, but very specific kind of feedback that is truly honest, that is truly honest. 
My daughter Stacy one time came home, and the neighbor next door, she was good friends with them, and um, th they had a boy her age, and she went to one of his basketball games with his parents, and on the way home, she got home, she stomped in, and she was like, they lied to him the whole way home. <laughs> they told him he did so great, and he sucked really bad. <laughs> and I said, well, did he do anything good? Well, he hung in there. He, like, didn't quit. He was just out there. Uh, and, she, and I said, what would be a, an honest thing to say? And that, that he hung in there, that was about it. Um, but sometimes, you know, even little kids, they get up and give a talk maybe in church, and everybody, oh, that was wonderful. Maybe it wasn't wonderful. And maybe, maybe they just had courage, and that was about it. So giving, the is this making sense to you? Really, because we think it's, we kind of be careful with lying um, and misleading, but saying the truth, and there's always something positive to say, um, even if you have to work really hard. <laughs> so, um, and then learning again from failure. That one is one of the reasons that women don't have as much leadership or confidence Ability is because we do not like failure as women. Men get used to it. In elementary school, boys are criticized eight times more than girls in elementary and on all the way up. And we say, poor boys. Well, we as girls, our girls are used to praise. And boys get, are used to being criticized. So 20 years later in the workplace or leading, Boys are like, oh, throw out ideas. Oh, you didn't like it. Well, that's OK. And then girls, what do we do? We're like, oh, oh my gosh. You know, because of some of the socialization. Um, but learning how to fail, actually, and fail and reflect, the research says, actually increases our confidence. And because we're acting, we're doing things. So getting used to like failing here and there. I'm, I'm pretty good at failure. I mean, I, a lot of people see all my successes, but they don't know how many <laughs> failures I've had along the way. I'm OK. I give myself like five minutes. I'm like, that sucks. Crap. Those are my two. <laughs> OK. Um, and also, let's be careful. I put this up to remind me. This is so easy to, to rely on sometimes, that always and never, we've got to be so careful when we're raising girls as leaders to, to not get into that, not teach them to do, give those words, because those, those are not helpful. Um, and so, the, as I said before, what can I learn from this? What can you learn from this? What, that, that question is really good to help our girls. Um, so of just three slides in part two, in the research on how to develop women leaders, there's three things, and I think it applies to raising girls too. There's three things that we have to underlie all the work we do when we're developing women leaders. And the first is this slide. It's calling and purpose, actually. Women more than men, girls more than boys, need to find a purpose. It's just not about having power and influence. It's like something inside of us needs to believe that it's important. You ran for mayor. You needed to know that it was important. We have to have a purpose. Boys and men, yeah, sure, some, but girls and women. So when we want to raise our girls to lead, we need to help them find that calling or purpose, whatever that is, to make a difference to, to in, in some way. Um, that's important. The second one is leadership identity. Actually, what we know from the research, not just my research, but all the research that's out there on this topic, is that boys and men, boys when they're ra you know, getting raised, see themselves as leaders. And part of that's because they see men leading, right? They see men, men, men. Oh, I can be a leader. And girls tend to, and we're not talking just in Utah, this is around the world. Girls tend to not see themselves as leaders. Studies over and over have little kids and then teenagers draw a leader. They say, draw a leader. 75%, this is globally, will draw a man because that's what they see. So girls don't see themselves as leaders. Helping them see other women leaders, think about leaders, hearing the word leader, many women 
that our leaders, even high-level leaders, I, I was running an event for a bunch of university presidents that were women a couple years ago. And a couple of them said, oh, I don't like the word leader. I don't like to admit I'm a leader. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> you are. <laughs> you get used to it. Um, so there's this weird thing that we have as women sometimes in terms of humility, which is very interesting in our culture, that word. Um, so find ways to let her lead and call it leadership. Leadership looks different ways, and it doesn't have to be loud. Leadership can be soft. If you have a, a daughter or a, a girl that you influence that's an introvert, I love the book Quiet. You like that book too? It's very good uh, in understanding those things. Um, and then the third, remember I said three. One is purpose and calling. Second one is identity. And the third one is actually unconscious bias. Mental, which is mental associations without awareness. So we, helping our daughters and, and girls that we influence understand that for themselves, their biases, how their mind works, but also how to deal with other biases that come to you are important. We have to, we have a need to categorize people and things, like us and them. So we stereotype all of the time. Even, even there's a research study on glasses where you don't even know it, but, but if I wear glasses, you look around and you see someone with glasses and you won't even know, but you're like, oh yeah, they know what I feel like, you know. <laughs> uh, reading glasses, that's, that's for, uh, you know, like, oh yeah, I connect somehow. I don't know why, but there's, you know, little kids when they're at a family reunion, they just go up to like somebody their same height and then they just walk off together and start playing, <laughs> right? It's, it, it, that's what they, they just do it, and it's unconscious. Um, you know, BYU football. My husband likes BYU football. <laughs> so anytime they, you know, if they're interviewing three or four people and someone, they have BYU football conversation, they won't remember that. They'll just think, oh, I like that fit. That is just nice. So there's all kinds of bias. So that's the third thing. So think about those. Over 1,500 studies now have been conducted on unconscious bias, and the findings are consistent. We have most of what happens is unconscious bias. So the more we understand about that, the better. So there's more and more of that training offered. And then really the last part is, and I'll go quickly through this, is confidence studies. So I'm giving you just hopefully uh, you'll take away a couple nuggets from this um, on things for yourself and for others that you influence. In terms of confidence, I don't want to depress you, but here it goes. <laughs> Evidence shows that generally women are less self-assured than men, have more self-doubt than men, have more anxiety in leaving their comfort zones, overthink and don't let go of defeats and mistakes as quickly, have hurt feelings longer than men, judge themselves harder. Is this shocking? Is this like shocking information to anybody? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, take longer to get started. Um, uh, again, after failure, don't use failure to learn as much as men. We beat ourselves up more than boys. And actually, this, the research extensive is, is found across cultures, incomes, uh, ages, professions, and generations. So knowing this, it helps us actually move forward. And so I'm going to put, and, and by the way, there's three reasons for this. There's some in genetics, a lot of socialization. And then sometimes it's just our choice. Sometimes people really don't have a great home life, didn't get that stuff, but they still have a big chunk that is choice. So um, in terms of socialization, they get that, girls can get that from homes and neighborhoods and churches, extracurricular programs. They consciously and unconsciously notice culture, mannerisms, style apologies, especially from their parents and female educators, the differences between men and women, how people react to behaviors, how you spend your time and so forth, and actions are more important than even words. Now, I put this slide up because one of the most interesting things in this research is this, that the more we have self-compassion, the more confidence we have. The more we beat ourselves up 
and don't, gives ourselves, don't give ourselves a break, the less confidence we have. Now, are you following this? Sometimes people think the opposite. But the more we beat ourselves up, sometimes we do things that are wrong and we just need to dang and then, get, then move on. But the more we say, I'm OK. I'm human. <laughs> That's OK. I didn't do so good tonight you know, in my game or whatever it is. But I'm OK. People do that. So I'm going to still do that. The more we love, the more we love ourselves and give ourselves a break, the stronger we will be, the more confidence we will, will have, and the more we can use our voices and lead for good. Sorry about the tears. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry about the tears. <laughs> so, OK. OK, I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I've got to go quick. But I'm going to put a couple of other things um, up. But rumination, helping our girls understand this at a younger age. Most women don't even understand this. But genetically, we ruminate more than men. We spin. Like something will happen. Like Michelle will be like really rude to me yesterday. She, you would Sorry, never be rude. <laughs> And I, and I will like, it, maybe, maybe my husband was there. He, two minutes later, he's over it. And then like later, I'm like, oh, that was so rude of Michelle to be rude to me. And then the next day, oh my gosh, I am going to email her and we just go on and on. And you know what? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. I just give myself like five minutes to really be ticked. And if it's a real big thing, I give myself a little, little more. But I have to say to myself, I'm done. I'm done. That's it. I'm moving on. Working and teaching girls about that, that, you can waste a lot of time ruminating. And this next one, do you know that word? Oh my gosh. We as women are perfectionistic way more than men. And the more that we are perfectionistic, the less we actually act. And confidence comes with acting. So. Man, we could get in deep. Maybe, well, let's talk about that on the panel. Let me move, move through. Um, taking risks. Girls do that less than men. Um, and there's many things. A risk can, can be showing up at an event if you're an introvert and talking to two people. That could be a risk. Um, but we need to be OK with failure and, and really give opportunities. Not crazy stuff. Oh, I shouldn't have put that picture up there. <laughs> That was not a good picture. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'm going to skip through a couple of them. Oh, this, this is just a little one that we can actually work on ourselves as parents, but also we can, can start helping our daughters and, and other girls with this. We have a habit to apologize, just like I did about my tears. <laughs> I just have one point to make, the just word. I really don't know whether this is accurate, but I don't know a lot, but I would like to say something. No big deal if you don't, but I would like a raise. <laughs> you probably won't agree, but I do think the event I organized went well. I'm sorry for bugging. Are you following this? So is this genetics? Is it socialization? Which, which one is that? OK. Babies don't just come out apologizing. <laughs> It is socialization, because we see our parents, we see our elementary school teachers. But this brings down a, just a little bit our confidence when we hear ourselves do it. But it also looks like we're not as confident to other people. So can you see, can, are you thinking of some things that you can do, have, even have conversations? And I, I, if you do this, which all of us do pretty much, uh, the best place to start is when you're writing an email. Go back and read it and take all the justs and apologies out. That, that helps you start thinking about it. Um, oh, we won't even go here. Let's talk about this on, <laughs> on the panel, too. But body image, you know that in the state of Utah, we are one of the highest in the nation on cosmetic surgery. Uh, we have more searches per capita than almost any other state in beauty products all the beauty products and all the cosmetic surgeries and, and all of those things. We are so high compared to the rest of the nation. I so just opened up a can of worms, and now I'm closing it right there, OK? <laughs> and then uh, imposter syndrome. Just You can look more about this. I don't have time to talk to you about it too much. 
But imposter syndrome, especially for girls, starts quite young. And that really is when you, let's say, um, in high school, maybe you got on the city, not the city council, but the student, what is it called? Student. Student. OK, I was close. And then you're like, I wonder when somebody, you feel like a fraud a little bit. You're like, hmm, I wonder if someone's going to find out that I really wasn't qualified. I wonder, is this sounding familiar to anybody? Uh, this happens, and that, can, that starts happening at young. So when we have the language, when we have the information, we can be better influencers, and we can recognize those. So each of these is kind of a big topic. The praise thing is really uh, most young women learn more than boys, girls do, to really seek for external praise, external validation. Um, and that can be problematic because if you expect other people to tell you you're great and it's external and not internal, you're really going to struggle with confidence and leadership. So, man, I'm opening things <laughs> that are so big and then close. So we deflect praise as well. I'm going to move through that. I'm going to move through this one too. Um, um, we do are socialized to girls learn to assume the blame when things go wrong while crediting circumstances for other people for their successes, and boys do the opposite. So this starts as young, really young, and there's research on I'm not good enough. That feeling starts when you're young too, and that's global research on I'm not good enough. So it's very fascinating because boys will, will through socialization mostly, if, if like college students after graduation, if they don't get a job very easily, the boys will say what? It's a, it's a hard economy, you know, something. And what do the young women say? I'm not good enough. That concept right there is huge. And the more that you as influencers understand this, the more we can spot that and try to help in terms of the reflection. And then the last principle, really, uh, there's two things, and they're related to the same. This one is being versus becoming. And if you have not read the book on growth mindset and mindsets, um, it is the best thing for parenting. And I will tell you, it is aligned with helping influence our kids, our sons and daughters, our other folks that we influence. I would really recommend that. But let me tell you the, the difference between being and becoming. So some of the research says, and actually quite a few studies, that when we talk to girls, we talk to them more in a state of being and to boys in a state of becoming. So you are beautiful. That's a state of being. You are smart. You are, help me out, kind, you know, whatever. And then boys, we talk about the effort effort to get someplace. You are becoming. You worked hard. You, so is this making sense to you? So if you, something happens and you fail your math test, then all of a sudden you are not smart. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing instead of becoming. And it's the same principle as the growth mindset. It's so fascinating. But we naturally do that and it's really sad isn't it but think about it and there's so many things that we naturally do different with boys and girls i had uh, a mayor actually not you um uh, a couple weeks ago that said i treat my sons and daughters exactly the same and i'm like you don't <laughs> you don't you can't you can't the more we're aware though we do, we think about christmas presents i mean there's all kinds of things that we do different um and, and so just being aware of that and helping, thinking about how we're raising and encouraging. But that mindset book is good. And also, by the way, the book Why Gender Matters is powerful. Anybody read that one? It is powerful stuff. It is powerful stuff. So my final slide really is this. There are lessons in everything. And if you are fully deployed, you will learn most of them. 
Experiences aren't truly yours until you think about them, analyze them, examine them, question them, reflect on them, and finally understand them. The point, once again, is to use your experiences rather than being used by them, to be the designer, not the design, so that experiences empower rather than imprison. Isn't that a beautiful quote? Um, it does, it takes a village to raise a girl. I think the real quote is a child, right? <laughs> and I, hopefully this, I know I've gone kind of quick, there's so much research on this, but hopefully I've, at least you're hearing some words and things, a couple of nuggets that you can do as young women yourselves to develop your leadership skills, but also for many of us, all of us, who influence girls and young women around us. Thank you.